Okay, we haven't talked about the Vietnam War. So many things happened at this time in history that we're going to have to split them up and go back to back. That's why we did Johnson's administration, then civil rights, then we'll get on the Vietnam War. But these things are all happening at the same time, which makes it kind of confusing. Well, the Vietnam War is going on during the time that we're talking about civil rights. And Martin Luther King Jr. has kept fairly silent on his opinions of the Vietnam War. But now he decides that he's going to speak on the war subject of the war. And he does so in May of 1967. So in May of 1967, Dr. King begins to speak out for the first time concerning the Vietnam War. Wait, are we in the Martin Luther King? So in May, in, May of 19, in May of 1967, Dr. King began to speak out against the Vietnam War. Now, what did he think we should be spending the money on instead of the war? But spe specifically what? Poverty. Poverty. So King believed in his heart that the money that we were spending on the Vietnam War, and when we get to the Vietnam War, I think you will be astonished at the amount of money we did spend in that war. He thought that money ought to be used at home in the United States to fight poverty. Because remember, he said that he could never fulfill his dream unless we could, we could battle and conquer poverty. Now, the problem with his speaking out against the war is he's going to drive a wedge between himself and who? President Johnson. President Johnson. And President Johnson has been a, a darn good ally of Martin Luther King Jr. And so... He's got to decide whether he's going to speak his mind and, and possibly drive a wedge between himself and the president, who has been an ally of his, or not. And he decides to speak his mind. And what now, did he do that May what? He did that May, well he started to talk about it in May of 1967. He hasn't officially made a statement, but he began to just speak a little bit about it in May of 67. He actually spoke made his first pub, he actually in April of 67, we'll get to that, in April of 67 is when he really made a comment. But the point to, to remember is that his speaking out against the war is going to be a little bit uh, edgy because Johnson isn't going to like that. Now, Dr. King stated publicly that he didn't believe there was any military solution to the war in Vietnam. And when he made that comment publicly, many Americans were shocked that he felt that way because when he made that comment, and you'll understand this more when we get into the war, there weren't that many people against the war at that time. It turns out there's going to be people that turn the tide and, and, and really feel strongly against war, but there were people that were shocked when he said that there was no military solution to the war. Now, what do you think his supporters thought about him talking out against the war? Didn't they have that? Wasn't this like when the black people Well, yeah, African Americans fought in Vietnam, no question. But what do you think his supporters thought when all of a sudden he began to speak against the war? What about us? What right about us is a, good, is a good answer. He did. They didn't believe that the Vietnam War was their struggle. Civil rights people didn't believe it was their struggle. Their struggle was civil rights, equal rights and opportunities for blacks. So. King's view on the war would take away from his efforts in the civil rights movement. And many of his supporters within the civil rights movement didn't believe that the Vietnam War was their struggle. It was somebody else's struggle to solve. They wanted to solve the problem of poverty and inequity among blacks in the United States. Now, King's outspoken views hurt the civil rights movement in three ways. King's outspoken views hurt the overall civil rights movement in three ways. Again, his outspoken view of the Vietnam War hurt the civil rights movement in three ways. Okay, what can you guess how it might have hurt him? That's controversial. So how might have it hurt his civil rights? Um that that's a good guess, but it's not one of the top three. The more importantly, who, what, he lost support of who? Oh, Some of his own followers. So, the first way that King's outspoken views hurt the civil rights movement is King lost support of some of his present followers. Lost some support of his present followers. 
Now, if you lose support of your present followers, what else might you lose that they contribute to the civil rights movement? Money. Money. So he lost financial support, number two. So King lost support of some of his present followers, and then he lost financial support for the civil rights movement. And another way that it hurt his civil rights movement is Americans in general, black and white, thought Martin Luther King ought to stick to civil rights and not get involved in foreign policy. They did not think that was right. And you'll see on a video that I show you later, a man with a picket sign against the Vietnam War yelled at Dr. King to stick to civil rights. Don't get into foreign policy. So King's outspoken views on Vietnam hurt his civil rights movement three ways. One, he lost support of some of his present followers. Two, he lost financial support for the civil rights movement. And three, well, many Americans thought Dr. King could, should stick to civil rights and not get involved in foreign policy. Now, during that summer of 1967, after King spoke out against the war, he became very, very depressed. Very depressed. And for the first time, he hints that maybe that the dream that he had during the March on Washington was never going to come about. So for the first time in the summer of 67, after becoming depressed, King, for the first time, states publicly that maybe his dream will never become a reality. This is what he said. He says, I must confess that dream that I had that day has in many points turned into a nightmare. Again, he said, I must confess that dream that I had that day has in many points turned into a nightmare. So he's starting to figure out that this dream he had during the speech on the March on Washington is getting farther and farther from being accomplished. Okay, does anybody have any questions on Martin Luther King Jr. and the Vietnam War? Probably would have been in his best interest to stay out of that. Who was Aubrey James That was a guy back off, that's in your notes, that shot at James Merritt when he made that march, remember, that led to black power? Yeah, some of that's in your notes. Okay, we're going to move to kind of an interesting time in 1968, and that was protest at the 1968 Summer Olympic Games. This was a big, big deal. We are preparing ourselves right now for the 2014 Winter Olympic Games in Russia. we got some issues there. And now we have Summer Games and we have Winter Games. The Summer Games are basically your track and field uh, dominated. But we're going to talk about protests at the 1968 Summer Olympic Games. And they were held in Mexico City, Mexico. Now we've talked about all kinds of protests, haven't we, in civil rights in the 1960s? Mostly led by Martin Luther King. Well, this protest at the 1968 Olympics, again because it's a sporting event, really, really caught the attention of America. And I'll make a comment here that's kind of tongue-in-cheek. But I've been in education for 34 years. I have not been to a school board meeting yet in my 34 years where anybody cared what type of biology books we were buying. What is the controversy in a school board meeting, usually? Sports. Okay, it, it, I'm not kidding you. I've been in many schools over 34 years. I've never had them really argue over an academic issue. They always argue over sports. It always happens. Well, that's the kind of attention sports gets in this country, and this is no different. So, in 1968, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, who are on your ID sheet, both won Olympic medals in track and field during the Games. In 1968, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, both these men, won Olympic medals in track and field during the Olympic Games. And the particular race I'm talking about was the 200 meter run, okay, halfway around the track. And in this 200 meter run at the 1968 Summer Olympic Games in Mexico City, Carlos placed third and won the bronze medal, and Tommy Smith placed first and won the gold medal. So again, Tommy Smith and John Carlos both won Olympic medals in track and field during the games in the 200 meter run. Carlos placing third and receiving the bronze medal, 
Smith placing first and receiving the gold medal. Well, what happens after they have a race or a swim race, anything? They have the medal ceremony and they play the national anthem of the winning athlete. In this case, it would be the Star Spangled Banner. And they all stand up on a podium. One guy stands on the one that says three, one stands on the one that says two, and one stands on the one that says one. And they play the national anthem. It's usually a very emotional time and a lot of athletes tear up. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's a really a cool thing to watch in the Olympics. Well, these two fellas did something very unusual and controversial during that ceremony. They both wore black scarves and each raised a black gloved fist into the air and put their heads down during the playing of the national anthem. Were they black? They were both black, yeah. So this is 1968, folks. So both men wore black scarves and each raised a black glove fist into the air with their heads down during the playing of the national anthem. Did they do it to disrespect the United States flag? No. No, they did it to show protest against racism in the United States. But how was it portrayed or perceived? Badly, that they were disrespecting the United States of America and our flag. So again, both men wore black scarves and each raised a black gloved fist into the air with their heads down to show protest against racism in the United States. Here is my son's autographed Tommy Smith huge poster that he sent me a picture of today showing Tommy Smith and John Carlos raising that black glove in protest during the medal ceremony. Yes. Um, isn't there like a story behind that where uh, Carlos forgot his gloves? He did. Carlos forgot his gloves and so he borrowed one of Smith's. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Oh, that's Very good. why it's on the other hand. Yeah, that's why it's on the other hand. But this is this was a ceremony. What else do you see on their lapels? Wasn't that the guy French? Close. What else do you see on their lapels? All three of them, matter of fact. A button. A button. You're going to see a button. I'll pass this around. There's a story behind that. However, both Smith and Carlos were suspended from the games and expelled from the Olympic Village for promoting black power at the Olympics. They were both suspended and sent home. They were expelled from the Olympic Village and suspended from the Games. Now, you'll hear that their medals were stripped from them. That is not true. They did not take their medals. Now, there's one more individual in that picture. And his name is Peter Norman. Peter Norman. And he won the silver medal in that particular 200 meter race. He ran it in 20.06 seconds, which is still a track and field record in Australia, where he was from. So Peter Norman is the man in that picture with Carlos and Smith. He finished second in the race, won the silver medal in a time of 20.06 seconds. Still one of the oldest track and field records in Australia. Now, those buttons. There was a movement called the Movement for Human Rights Project. And it had actually inspired the protest by Smith and Carlos. And they had buttons made, just like the March on Washington buttons. And Norman was sitting there waiting for the medal ceremony, and he talked to Carlos and Smith and said he believed in that movement. He believed in the Movement for Human Rights Project. He didn't necessarily say he believed in what they did at the medal stand, but he believed in that movement. And so Smith gave Norman a button which he wore on his tracksuit during the ceremony. So that's why he has a button. Now, as Zach so astutely stated, Carlos had forgotten his gloves. So it was Norman that suggested that each of the Americans wore one of Smith's gloves. So that's where that story came from, Zach. Very good. 
So Carlos had forgotten his gloves, and at Norman's suggestion, each of the Americans wore one of Smith's gloves. So here's Peter Norman, kind of in the middle of the thick of the controversy, although he's not involved. He just wore the button. However, Australia's Olympic authorities reprimanded Norman for his actions, and he was basically ostracized by the Australian media. They wouldn't even talk to him. So he paid a price as well for being there and for wearing the button. So again, Australia's Olympic authorities reprimanded Norman. What's reprimand mean? Slap you on the wrist, write a letter in your file. Like if a teacher gets reprimanded for not turning the grades, you put a letter in their file, they don't get fired. But if you get enough met reprimands, what happens? You get fired. Well, if you get enough reprimands, probably in the Olympics, you get, don't get to compete for that team. But he was reprimanded and ostracized by the Australian media. Now, he paid for it for quite a few years because even though he finished third in the trials, and the trials are what gets you, like the United States has trials, and if you finish the top three in like the 200 in the trials, then you make the Olympic team. Even though he finished third in the trials, they left him off the 1972 Australian team. Mainly, they think, because of this. So even though in the next Olympics, he actually qualified by being in the top three, they left him off the team, the Australian Olympic team. Now, he continued to compete, but he tore his Achilles tendon in 1985, and he contacted, contracted gangrene in that Achilles, and they almost had to amputate his leg. We're talking about Norman here, because he's the tragedy of this story. Okay, So he continued to run, but he tore his Achilles tendon in 1985, and he contracted gangrene, which is G-A-N-G-R-E-N-E, -E, gang and then R-E-N-E, -E, and he nearly had to have his leg amputated. So his career was over. So what did he start doing because of his depression? Drinking. So because of depression and heavy drinking over his life, he died of a heart attack in 2006 at the age of 64. Oh, so he was young. Yeah, 64 is fairly young, you know, for an athlete. Yeah, so he died of a heart attack on October 3rd, 2006. Now, how many years from the 68, 78, 88, 98, 2008? So, like 38 years later, he died. October 3rd, 2006. Guess who served as his pallbearers? Smith and Carlos. Traveled to Australia and served as his pallbearers. Go ahead. I'll go back ways, yeah. So again, despite finishing third in the trials, Norman was left off the 1972 Australian Olympic team. He continued to compete, but he tore his Achilles tendon in 1985, contracted gangrene in his foot, and nearly led to his amputation of his leg. He became depressed and drank heavily over the years and died of a heart attack on October 3, 2006 at the age of 64. Both Smith and Carlos traveled to Australia to be his pallbearers. 64. Any questions on the protest? Um, I'm gonna, we're, gonna, we're, we're going to cover a little thing here. I'm going to give you a couple of things. Do you know what Abby Carver brought me to the Olympic trials? Did he? Oh, did he really? I saw this picture in the office yesterday. In my office? Or? No, in the... Where I work. Where? Where I work. Oh, did you really? What? I'm pretty sure it was this picture. No regrets. So he got Okay, let's read through this quiet, please, and we'll get through this. This obviously came out several years ago after this. Here we go. We'll start with this side here. The 1968 U.S. Olympic men's track and field team was considered the greatest in history, producing world records by Bob Beeman, Lee Evans, and Jim Hines. Those performances, however, were overshadowed by the black power demonstration of Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Smith, the 200-meter gold medalist at Mexico City, and Carlos, the 2000, excuse me, 200 bronze medalist, were members of the Olympic Project for Human Rights. 
a group of athletes organized to protest the treatment of blacks in the United States. After Smith's victory and Carlos's third place finish, the two mounted the victory stand barefooted wearing civil rights buttons. As the Star Spangled Banner played, Smith and Carlos bowed their heads and each raised a black gloved hand in the black power salute. The International Olympic Committee was outraged and wanted punishment. The U.S. Olympic Committee responded by suspending the two athletes and ordering them from the Olympic Village. The episode shadowed Smith and Carlos for years. I have no regrets. I had no regrets. I will never have any regrets, Smith said Tuesday by phone from his home in Santa Monica, California. We were there to stand up for human rights and to stand up for black Americans. We wanted to make them better in the United States. Smith was speaking to three of his teammates at a gathering honoring the 1968 team. Present were Beeman, this was an incredible feat, who shattered the world record in the long jump of the leap of 29 feet, two and a half inches, a mark that stood for 23 years. Bill Tomei, who set an Olympic record in winning the decathlon, and Vince Matthews, the leading runner on the 1600 meter relay team, that set a world record. Beeman was surprised at the furor the demonstration created. There was an incredible response from the press and the USOC, said Beeman, 51, a member of the National Track and Field Hall of Fame, and now working with youth groups and putting together a movie and book about his career. It was unfortunate there was so much protest going on. It was interpreted the wrong way. There were a lot of protests going on in the country then. The Vietnam War, Indians, Jews, etc. It started about one and a half years before when Martin Luther King was fighting for us. We had to continue protest. Although America was not the strongest country in the world, we were not per perfect. Tumay, 59, also in the Hall of Fame and now a director for a nutritional supplement supplier, sympathized with his teammates. I was moved by it, he said. Tommy and John had unique personalities. I respect what they did. The consequences of what they did didn't affect anyone who was a racist. It was an act of courage. We needed to do that. We needed that to happen. We needed more peaceful demonstrations to make people aware. Matthews, 50, refused to stand attention during the National Anthem when he won the 400 in 1972, as did silver medalist Wayne Collette. Both were protesting conditions in the United States. Those actions were spontaneous. The 68 demonstration, Matthews said, was planned. You knew it was going to take place because we had meetings, Matthews said. We all had different opinions on what it would take to do it. It was left up to each individual what to do when he got to the stand. Some felt more militant than others. Tommy and John were very strong about their feelings. Smith said athletes realized something had to be done, but thought the Olympic Games was not the place. It was meant to get a respectful response. It was, how do you say that? Sophomoric. Sophomoric, yeah, thank you. To view it as a malignant gesture. Smith said the protest was detrimental to his life. I had to fight to get back, he said. Things were so bad for Smith that he, that he, that didn't, he wrote that wrong. Things were so bad for Smith that when he returned to school, he had to attend night classes. I didn't want to be seen, he said. We had put our lives on the line. It was life-threatening. Smith no longer has the black glove. Somewhere on the way home, I must have lost, he said. But he still has his gold medal, his Olympic ring, and other memorabilia from the games. Let me open my closet right here, he said, laughing. Let's look at the back page. Peter Norman, 64. This year in sports. The third man in one of the most famous photos in sports, U.S. winners Tommy Smith and John Carlos was raising their glove fists on the 200 meter medal stand at the 1968 Mexico City Olympics, played a key role in its origin. Carlos had forgotten his pair of gloves. Norman, an Australian who won the silver, suggested he wear one of Smith's. Norman, whose Olympic time of 20.06 still stands as a record. Down under, supported by their black power statement, by wearing a badge during the medal ceremony, and the three men remain close. Carlos and Smith traveled to Australia to serve as pallbearers at Norman's funeral. I'm going to tell you a couple other things about this hat, what happened. One good, one bad. Bob Beeman, this long jumper, broke the world record in the long jump by such a long distance, he jumped basically out of the pit. And they had to bring in a special measuring device to measure it because he jumped completely out of the area they thought anybody could jump and broke the world record by over a foot, I believe. It was an incredible jump. The negative side is Lee Evans was a black man who won the 400 that year. And he took tremendous heat for not doing what? For not protesting. He basically stood on the metal stand, put his hand over his heart, 
and did it like you were supposed to, and he took heat for doing it that way. So it was a tough time in, in athletics, and people suffered on either end of the, of the spectrum. But people will not soon forget the 68 Olympics and this particular picture. Uh, my son gets a lot of compliments. I bought him this for Christmas. This is a huge poster that Tommy Smith signed for us, and then we had it framed. I've talked to Tommy Smith on the phone many years ago. He was a track coach at Long Beach uh, University, and he talked a little bit about it. But uh, whenever you get an anniversary of 68, usually these guys will come out. Okay, any questions on a protest in the 68 Olympics? Yes? I'm surprised that they let like, black people be on the Olympic teams since it was so... Why did they? Good. Hey, here's a great point. Why did the black athletes get to be in the Olympics? Because they're good. Now, if they were bad, you might have seen some other issues. The, if you look at the Olympic team at that time, it was dominated by black athletes, and they took offense to the fact of the contribution they were making to make America look great in the Olympics, but yet were treated so poorly. Yeah. Um, were they allowed in the Olympics before they were allowed like, to serve militarily? Well, well, Jesse Owens, remember his big controversy at 36 Olympics when Adolf Hitler before World War II? Adolf Hitler was just appalled that, that a black, he called him something different, would even be able to compete in the Olympics, and Owens won several gold medals and embarrassed the, the Germans beyond belief. And you have to look that up, that's an interesting choice. So they have been competing for quite a while. What about in the Olympics? There's no, no really winner, I guess. They keep track of gold and silver medals, but we made a good show, I'll assure you. Okay, let's move on to a real somber thing. And How long has the Olympics been? Oh, I since the 1900s, I'm sure. So, like, when was the Civil War? After the Civil War. Yeah. After the Civil War. So, did they get to serve while they were under Well, there were blacks that served in the Civil War that fought on the northern side. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, we're going to move to kind of a somber piece of information. That's the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. This is going to be a tough, tough decade. John Kennedy's assassination. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, and we'll be talking later about Bobby Kennedy's assassination. So anyway, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. That kind of ties in with the timeline we've been going. In late March 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. traveled to the city of Memphis, Tennessee. In late March 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. traveled to the city of Memphis, Tennessee. And the reason that he traveled to Memphis, Tennessee on that, in that month of that year is he was there to support a strike by black sanitation workers. So the purpose of Martin Luther King's visit to Memphis, Tennessee in March of 1968 was to support a strike by black sanitation workers. So how did he usually handle these situations? What did he plan usually? And then a march, or vice versa. Well again, a peaceful protest march was scheduled, but again, violence found its way quickly. So again, a peaceful protest march was scheduled, but it didn't take long for violence to find its way, its way to that particular demonstration as well. Now, I told you that King was starting to think about what? His death. his death as a result of the Civil Rights Movement. And even though he feared for his safety when he went to Memphis, he was determined to direct this peaceful march regardless, as he always had done. Okay? He had that in the back of his mind that he could lose his life in this movement. But despite that, despite a fear for his safety, he was determined to direct a peaceful march. So, on April 3rd, 1968, he gave another great speech, just a tremendous speech. On April 3rd, 1968, gave a speech. Now, I want you to put your pens or pencils down, and I want you to listen to this part of his speech and tell me what you think he was talking about or alluding to. Here's what he said. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And He has allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. 
My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Last speech he ever gave. Okay? The night before. On April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. On I April... Have that day off from school, sir. I'm going to talk about that. You just take... That's a great... You just stay with that. Okay? I'm going to tell you about that. On April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. He was staying at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. He was staying at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. Not a very fancy motel. Matter of fact, quite the opposite. He was staying in room 306 at the Lorraine Hotel on April 4th, 1968. And he was on the top floor, just a two-story two building. It had a rail around it. And he decided to step out on the balcony right in front of his room to get some fresh air. So he steps out on the balcony of room 306 at the Lorraine Hotel to get some air. As he stood on the balcony, looked down, he noticed some friends. He began to speak to them from above on the balcony down to where the parking area was. You, you've seen these motels. So he stood on the balcony outside of room 306 at the Rain Hotel. He looked down, saw some friends. He had some of his followers around him. He began to speak. Suddenly at 5.30 p.m., one single shot rang out. Suddenly at 5.30 p.m., one single shot rang out. Dr. King was shot in the neck, and the bullet tore the entire right side of his jaw, gone. He was hit in the neck, and tore out the right side of his jaw. He was shot from the window of a boarding house about 205 feet away across an empty lot. He was shot from the window of a boarding house some 205 feet away, which would be about approximately 70 yards. Shot from a window of a boarding house across the way. Shot in the neck, bullet tore away the right side of his jaw. How many feet? 205 feet, about 70 yards, less 70 yards. 205 feet. Eyewitnesses stated they saw a young white man fleeing the scene in a white automobile immediately after the shooting. It was a 64 Ford Mustang. A kind of a distinguished car, you know, a noticeable type car. So eyewitnesses stated they saw a young white man fleeing the scene in a white automobile immediately after the shooting turned out to be a Ford Mustang, one of the old fastback Mustangs. Eyewitnesses state they saw a young white man fleeing the scene in a white automobile immediately after the shooting. On the sidewalk by the boarding house was a Browning rifle with a scope, marksman scope. On the sidewalk by the boarding house was a Browning rifle with a marksman scope. Okay, eyewitnesses stated that they saw a young white man fleeing the scene in a white automobile right after the shots were fired. Shot was fired. Mustang. As soon as they got a description on the young white man, the police sent out an all points bulletin and started to investigate. The landlady of the boarding house stated that the man that they had seen flee had registered as John Willard. So the landlady of the boarding house stated that the man that they saw flee the scene of the shooting was registered as John Willard. Back at the assassination scene, King's aides desperately tried to assist him. He was rushed to a local hospital, and at 7.05 p.m., 7.05 p.m., Martin Luther King Jr. was pronounced dead at the age of 39. 
So at 7.05 p.m., after being rushed to the hospital, after being assisted by his followers on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel, Martin Luther King Jr. was officially pronounced dead at the age of 39 at 7.05 p.m. What did King's death set off? Riots. Urban rioting in more than 100 cities, most noticeably Chicago and Washington, D.C. So King's death set off urban rioting and violence in more than 100 cities across the country. And probably the most noticeable or most violent were those in Chicago and Washington, D.C. It was so bad in Washington, D.C. that National Guard troops protected the Capitol with machine guns. The rioting was so bad in D.C. that National Guard troops protected the Capitol with machine guns. In Chicago, it was so bad that Mayor Daley ordered police to shoot to kill any suspected rioters who were endangering others. Shoot to kill. That's how much out of control they were. So again, in Chicago, Mayor Daley ordered police to shoot to kill any violent rioters. And in Washington, D.C., the National Guard troops had to protect the Capitol with machine guns. Now, I just want you to listen to this. In Indianapolis, Indiana, Robert Kennedy heard of the assassination of Martin Luther King, Jr. He was speaking in a black ghetto in Indianapolis when the news came out. He was getting ready to speak to those people who had no idea that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. So guess who broke the news to the people in Indianapolis? Robert Kennedy. And this is what he said. And I want you to listen. This is fairly lengthy, but I want you to listen to it. Think about this. He's going to break the news in a black ghetto in Indianapolis about Martin Luther King being assassinated. Okay? This is what he said. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm only going to talk to you just a minute or so this evening because I have some, some very sad news for all of you. Could you lower those signs, please? Signs and support, because he's running for the presidency, which we'll get into later. I have some very sad news for all of you, and I think sad news for all our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. Can you imagine the reaction to that? Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice between fellow human beings. He died in the cause of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it's perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence evidently is that there were white people who were responsible, you can be filled with bitterness and with hatred and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country in greater polarization, black people amongst blacks and white amongst whites, filled with hatred toward another, or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and replace that violence, that stain of, stain of bloodshed that has spread across our land, with an effort to understand compassion and love. For those of you who are black and are tempted to and are tempted to fill with or be filled with hatred and mistrust of the injustice of such an act against all white people, I would only say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to get beyond these rather difficult times. So I ask you tonight to return home, to say a prayer for the family of Martin Luther King. Yeah, it's true, but more importantly, to say a prayer for our own country, which all of us love, a prayer for understanding and that compassion of which I spoke. Was there a riot in Indianapolis that evening? No. no. That's how powerful his words were. Well, within two weeks of King's assassination, they had the name of the suspect that shot Dr. King, and it was not John Willard. He had used an alias when he checked into that uh, boarding house. His name was James 
Earl Ray. So it took the police two weeks after King's assassination to come up with the suspect's name, James Earl Ray. They had his name, but they did not have him. On June 8, 1968, 65 days after they got the name, actually 65 days after King was assassinated, guess where Ray was found? London, England. So on June 8, 1968, 65 days later, London police picked up Ray. How'd they find him? Got pulled over. Worse than that. Drunk. Arrested. He got arrested for, for doing what? Murder. Murder. Robbing a bank in London. He was out of money. He's on the run. Ran out of money. The only way he could find money was to rob a bank. So he robbed a bank. They picked him up. They put two and two together and got the fact that he was the suspected assassin of Dr. King. So he was returned to the United States and formally charged with the murder of Dr. King. Had to get an attorney, and his first attorney was Percy Foreman. And guess what advice he gave Ray? Plead guilty. Plead guilty, because the evidence is so overwhelming against you, if you go to trial and they convict you, they will give you the death penalty, the electric chair. So Foreman believed that the evidence was so overwhelming that Ray would be convicted and given the death sentence, by electrocution, so he advised his client to plead guilty to the murder. Ray took his advice, pled guilty, and was sentenced to 99 years in prison in Tennessee. Did not get the death penalty. That was the bargain they made. That's what Foreman did for him. So he was sentenced to 99 years in prison in Tennessee as part of the agreement. And we'll finish today with this. Just three days after his confession, Ray complained that he was innocent, stating he was misled by Foreman and was pressured into the guilty plea. So just three days after his confession, Ray complained that he was innocent and he stated he was misled by his attorney, Percy Foreman, and Foreman had pressured him into a plea. So what's he going to do next? He's going to get a new attorney, J.B. Stoner, and they're going to request a new trial. Pretty good name in the 60s. Okay. So he gets a new attorney, J.B. Stoner, to represent him. They're going to request a new trial, and I'll tell you tomorrow if that works very well. Okay.